This is a story about a young homeless gay black man who joins the Marine Corps to win back his mother's love, her validation, and ultimately learns how to respect and validate himself by enduring boot camp. You know, so I think in that way, this comes from you know a really universal desire of mine to reconnect with my mom who kicked me out. You know, this is my story. And then just from a, a functional level, I wrote the first draft of this script while I was still a film student at NYU Grad Film um, in 2017, and it took from then until now for it to make it to the silver screen. So it's been a long journey, but super fulfilling. I always say that this movie, The Inspection, is 100% autobiographical when it comes to the desires, the fears, and the motivations of Ellis French, even if the circumstances, specific circumstances are not things that I've gone through personally. Uh, Ellis French is a composite, you know, uh, don't ask, don't tell, maybe got coined during the Clinton administration, but really the kind of functional silence and erasure of queer people in America's armed forces has been going on, had gone on for almost a hundred years prior to this film coming out. So to me, French's, you know, his story, his journey is built out of so many podcasts and friends of mine who've gotten kicked out and LGBTQ uh, service members who, you know, were dishonorably discharged and had to start their lives over. So his experience is their experience. In terms of my life and what I left out, this wasn't a process of remembrance, right? It wasn't like I just remembered, set it up and shot the movie. Instead, this has been a process of experience, right? Of trying to create the cinematic circumstances that can get to the essence of things. So, you know, there are a lot of things like, for instance, there's this conversation that happens between Ellis French and his mother Inez at the end of the film, happens in the hallway. I had a very similar conversation with my mom about maybe two years before she passed on a phone. She wouldn't even say it to me in person. You know, so that kind of juxtaposition of the real event, like what is the essence of the thing that made me feel, right? And then what is a way that I can invite the audience into that moment? Um, who People who will never read my story, who may not ever really put the pieces together that what's happening on screen, that parts of that happened to me. You know, I'm trying to find those, those kind of moments of inflection, if you will, that I feel can like resonate beyond. And now I'm closing New York Film Festival, so I think I found them, you know? <laughs> At the end of the day, this is a pro-troop film, and it's not an anti-military film, nor is it a pro-military film. Um, for me, this is about one gay black man's journey from homelessness to empowerment. So in that regard, you know, I identify with and deeply empathize with folks who arrive at life-changing moments through desperate situations. So this film is squarely on the side of that human connection that these young men and women form during boot camp. And honestly, as a Marine, you know, I, I hate to make it sound super idealistic, but in reality, the thing we always say to ourselves is there's no such thing as a black or a white Marine. There's only dark green and light green, right? So suffice it to say the US military for all of the criticism that people could levy at it, which I think at times can be valid, right? At the end of the day, the US military is one of the most progressive institutions in the history of the United States. And if we're looking at it from a, from a concept of like empowerment of outsider groups, whether it be women or people of color, the US military has always been ahead of the curve for the rest of the country. So it's not without conflict, but for me, you know, I feel that the, the, my personal experience as a Marine was positive overall. I may not agree with everything they do, you know, but I'm grateful for the community and the family, the chosen family that I found. And I think people will resonate with this idea of chosen family in this film. Well, I kind of always joke that I have a cinematic dyslexia and that I can't tell the difference between documentary and fiction. You know, I think both processes are concerned with truth. You know, um, as a documentarian, I'm very much a verite filmmaker flying on the wall. So you're just living with people for hours on end until something real, truthful happens and you're chasing it. And then as a fiction filmmaker, you know, I think the way that helps is that, you know, you might block it, rehearse it, you know, do all of these things, light it. And then the actors do something that's totally unexpected that feels way more honest and truthful than what you wanted. So now you've got to chase it. So in that regard, I just feel like my job as, a, as an artist is to chase the truth and find light, whatever <laughs> genre. I'm a real photography buff, you know, so I came to this project with a 
ton of photographic references. Um, people like William Eggleston, you know, in terms of like how we approach this southern landscape, right? People like Sally Mann were informing this. Uh, in terms of how we presented the the young men on screen, this is you know very much Philip Walker de Corsha, the great Nan Golden, who's literally one of my favorite artists ever. You know, were types of things that we were looking at from a filmmaking standpoint. You know, Claire Denis' Beau Travail, Gio Panza Corvo's Battle of Algiers, and ultimately Rocky were like huge influences on how this story came together. Right, we're really trying to give that hero's journey, but make it personal and like. And also, like in the context of like the the boot camp film, right? Which, yes, it's an autobiography, but it's also a military film, and that's its own kind of fraught genre within Hollywood, right? We wanted to really honor the experience of being queer in that space, and in reality, you know, boot camp hasn't changed that much in like the last hundred years, right? But the people who've come to boot camp have totally, you know, been transformed in the last hundred years. So in that regard, we wanted to make this kind of visual language that when we're in French's point of view, it's like beau travail, it's handheld, it's, you know, but when we see French operate in the world, it's full metal jacket. You know, it's this idea of the shaky ground that queer service members stand on when they're serving their country. It's awesome being with Animal Collective. I feel like I'm now like the fifth member of the band. Um, I have a home in Baltimore and I'm kind of bouncing between New York, Baltimore and LA all the time. So it was important for me now that I have a presence in Baltimore to really kind of wrap myself up in the arts community. So I reached my, my partner, creative partner, Chester, and the producer of the film, Chester Jordan Gordon, knows that I'm an indie rocker. I have that element to me, knows that I love Animal Collective. We've just moved to Baltimore. He's like, why don't you just reach out to them and see if they'd want to do the movie? And we reached out and they were down. And now we did the movie. And, and the soundtrack itself is really an exploration. Like the way I look at French in this film is that French is finding a new religion, right? The religion that he was born to, that Christianity maybe didn't really embrace him the way that it should have. The culture of the streets embraced him, but couldn't offer, you know, sustenance. So from a musical standpoint, we were really interested in exploring call and response and also like various types of like, you know, Gregorian chant um, and, you know, even like notions of like, you know, kind of the Beach Boys, Brian Wilson concepts around harmony so that this, you know, this person that is French, these individuals and the rest of the troupe ultimately come together into this kind of like uh, symphonic, um, but mostly vocal uh, arrangement. And that was, you know, just totally made better through our collaboration with Animal Collective. Watching Jeremy perform is intoxicating, and I'd have to remind myself, wait, you're a director, you're not the audience. You need to have something to say, <laughs> you know, because he's so incredible. Um, so there's, there's that element of just, you know, this is a double Tony nominee um, in the same year for two different parts, right? He's an Emmy nominee, and I had never really worked with classically trained actors that much before. Most of my other films have been, you know, if I made a documentary and I found compelling people, I would bring them over to my narrative work, you know? Mm -hmm. So just the difference in the ability and the accuracy to reproduce the emotional intent and then to have that as a layer and then to add to it, right? Just his ability to just repeat it and advance it was just astonishing to me. Um, and just on a personal level, yeah, it's my, a lot of this is my story. I have gone through a phenomenal emotional roller coaster to get to this point as an artist. And a lot of that concentrated in the making of the film. My mom passed, um, COVID happened, you know. So I was really, really moved and I felt so safe with Jeremy. Jeremy would comfort me when I would cry. Jeremy would check in with me before you know, making these you know, bold and just really brilliant creative decisions on his character, he would check in with me and make sure that I didn't feel like my catharsis and my healing was being lost. And I appreciate that. You know, I think you know he's he knew he he knew a lot more than me coming into this process, and I'm grateful for his his guidance and his his instrument.
I tell Bokeem, I told him, I was like, when I was 14, you know, you were my main crush. So like I had a poster of you on my wall. So, you know, there's that part of just being a fan of Bokeem Woodbine and having him in your face. And he's like talking to you and listening to you. Like that's just wild, you know, um, in terms of working with him, he's a capital A actor. I think he's, you know, criminally underrated for what he brings to this art form. He, um, we had a lot of really meaningful discussions about drill instructor Leland Laws, uh, primarily talking about how this is a person who's been, you know, the commentary on the war in Iraq is in this film. It's, but it's written into the lived experience of the people. And Bokeem is someone, his, or rather Laws is someone whose character, he, he's been to Iraq four or five times, taken a lot of bodies and his, mentality of protection is built totally out of his guilt for what he failed to do in you know operation desert storm it's a pretty you know tenuous balance right because it's pretty easy for him just to be a jerk but to understand that he's not a jerk he's actually somebody who's trying to protect people by bringing what he can the, the he only has so much he can do in boot camp to these young men mm -hmm. to prepare them for what they're going to see on the battlefield, right? Mm -hmm. So Bokeem and I really found that nice kind of middle ground where we were able to be honest to his role as like, you know, the taciturn, tough drill instructor, the kill hat, mm -hmm. right? But also being aware of his pain, of Leland's pain, of Laws' pain, that he's, he's lost people that he cares about. And he, and, and he can't ever get them back. So all he can do is protect th these recruits from losing more. And I think that kind of, and, but also the humor of laws as well, because it's like, ultimately it's so absurd, right? The way that men have been kind of societally thought, taught to process real emotion. You know, it's, it's like John, you watch a John Wayne movie now and half the time you laugh at it because it's like nobody feels this way, right? So finding those gray areas in this character to make him three-dimensional, but make him honest and authentic to what I experienced in boot camp, that's what Bokeem and I were able to do. Having a person like Gabrielle Union, you know, um, it's strange because she's my actress, but in a way she's also my mentor. And she's been in this business for so long and she's such an incredible professional. Like she knows her mark. She's on, t she's early to set. She knows everything is prepared and ready to go. So that was a relief because whenever she was around, her presence demanded structure, right? And then that structure became educational for me. Um, on a personal level, like I said, my mom passed. I got this movie, this was greenlit in February, 2020. My mom passed February 18th of 2020. And then, you know, COVID happened. So when I arrived on set, it was, for instance, when he goes in the beginning of the film to get his birth certificate, I hadn't been in my mother's apartment since I had been kicked out of it over 20 years ago. So when I wrote the script, I definitely meant to, I, I know I was trying to, in some essence, recreate it. But when I walked on set into the physical location, it was very triggering because this is a space that, you know, just carries a lot of conflicting emotions for me, complicated emotions. You know, my mother was the first person to ever love me and the first person to fully reject me. So it's complicated. And I think Gabby did a really great job of holding that complication. And I'm extremely grateful for Gabby because she brought my mother back to life. The conversations that I wasn't able to have with her in person, I was able to have through Gabrielle on set. And, you know, I'm just eternally grateful. And I'm excited that audiences are starting, are feeling what we felt together on set, you know, um, that kind of intense intimacy and shared vulnerability that she brings to the character. I'm thrilled that people are seeing her as an artist and, uh, and the way I've always seen her. The inspection has been a remarkably cathartic experience for me. Um, I guess I can just give you a story that might be better. Like, you know, in the, one of the closing scenes, uh, Inez says to French, uh, Ellis French, that, you know, she can love him but not love what he is, right? That she'd wish she left him in a shoebox. She could have left him anywhere, any doorstep. I grew up hearing that pretty much my whole life, you know? Um, especially as I started to get older and become sexually mature, right? And I wasn't proving to be the type of man my mother wanted me to be. 
Um, and when I was on set, hearing it, it broke me down just as much as it broke me down when I was 14, 15, 16 hearing it. And I had to hear it like 50 times, <laughs> not 50. We didn't have enough money to shoot it 50 times, but, um, <laughs> but you know, many times. And it was crazy because we yelled cut, we rapped for the day, I got in my car and everything was fine. I had lived through, I had survived hearing that. I had survived believing that I deserve to be abandoned for who I am. And not only had I survived it, but I made it to this film to tell that story. And that's really what this is about for me, right? I'm making this movie for anyone who's ever felt disregarded, anyone who's ever felt overlooked and abused, to remind them of the power that they have within, that, that all the good things that they believe they're capable of are true. And this film is an objectified proof of that, right? A person who was homeless, kicked out for being gay, for whom homophobia could have completely ruined them, has lived to make this for you. So hopefully when people watch that, anybody, whether gay, straight, black, old, young, what have you, they'll be able to see that and know that in their own struggles that they can triumph as well. For me as a New Yorker and a filmmaker, I went to Columbia University. So my first time coming to Lincoln Center was as a student. Um, and I wasn't a filmmaker at that time. So to have had the inspection land at the 60th anniversary of the New York Film Festival is an absolute dream come true. I feel like my, my street cred in New York has gone way up, you know? So I'm excited. <laughs>